Freaks is one of the most memorable horror films from the golden age of horror. But on the surface, it is entirely unlike other classics of that era. There's nothing sexy about Freaks, unlike what we see in Dracula. There's no reincarnated allure, as in The Mummy. There's no adventurous spectacle, as so wonderfully on display in King Kong. And there's no mad scientist, perhaps the biggest trope of them all, as there was in Frankenstein. In fact, there's no abnormal monster in Freaks. There are just humans, their humanity, and their inhumanity. When Freaks was released in 1932, the critics hated it. Audiences turned their backs on it. Studio MGM recut it, chopping out half an hour of material, before abandoning the film completely and selling off the distribution rights. And director Todd Browning lost his career over the film. Yet, here I am, today, calling Freaks one of the most important horror films ever made. I am not alone in holding that opinion. To understand Freaks, we have to look at its director, Todd Browning. Browning was born Charles Albert Browning in Louisville, Kentucky on Monday, July 12, 1880. How he came by the name Todd, we'll never know. Though it seems to suit him, as Todd means fox in English, clever in Scottish, and death in German. Todd Browning's biographers David J. Skull and Elias Savada have no answer for the name choice. The authors make it quite clear that facts about his early life were hard to root out. Browning was enigmatic, private, and unwilling to discuss his life in show business. When Dark Carnival came out in 1995, it was the very first major book about one of Hollywood's formative horror directors. But was he really a horror director? Most of his films were macabre, but until he made Dracula, none of these films featured a supernatural villain. Though, American horror films in the 1920s rarely featured the supernatural. Todd Browning's films, instead, focused on the dark side of life. They were usually crime films, but had the culture of the studio system allowed it, he would likely have made supernatural horror earlier. As it was, Browning was finally able to push Universal into making Dracula in 1931, no doubt in small part because of studio executive Carl Lemley Jr., who was able to convince his studio head father to give supernatural horror a chance. And it is Dracula for which Browning is mostly known. It jump-started supernatural horror and the golden age of horror in the 1930s. Without it, Universal Pictures might not have survived the Great Depression. But according to his biographers, Todd Browning hated Dracula. The film had been taken away from him in the editing room, and many of the visual flourishes in the film are more in tune with cinematographer Carl Freund's often roving camera than with Todd Browning's usually static, carnival spectator style of filmmaking. As an example, look at the camera work in these three Carl Freund films. Note the mobility and sense of spectacle in Metropolis. Freud's cinematography applied an entirely different, more intimate style, and a sense of tense claustrophobia in Key Largo. Take in the vibrancy of these images in The Mummy, which was one of only a few films that Freud directed. Freud actually is one of the most important cinematographers in the history of the moving image, simply because he invented so many styles. That includes the style of television sitcoms, which he first developed in I Love Lucy. And now let's look at films where Todd Browning had more creative control than he did in Dracula. Note that Browning often elects to film his material from the point of view of a sideshow spectator. The scenes are staged in a static, theatrical manner, and the life and movement is primarily supplied by the actors, not the camera. However, it wasn't his cinematic style that made him important as a storyteller, but rather it was Browning's offbeat focus and the themes he chose to explore. In an era where studio heads ruled and directors were often assigned to pictures, Todd Browning remained stubbornly committed to his own artistic point of view. He stuck to the same themes in his stories, repeating them from film to film. And these themes were often taboo. For instance, like borderline incestuous, often abusive, or at the very least uncomfortable to watch relationships between fathers and daughters. Browning dabbled in dark sexual undertones, seen so clearly in Dracula, 
and he took the sideshow performer or criminal's point of view in stories, inviting audiences into worlds of obsessive and damaged men. It was a much needed point of view, since the Great War left so many men as crippled outsiders. It's not surprising that Todd Browning took this offbeat path. Browning had started his entertainment career as a sideshow performer. Since he had nothing particularly freakish to display, he had to resort to other tricks, including an act of being buried alive, called the Buried Man. The trick was simple. The performer would be buried in a coffin for a few days, and people would pay to look down a tube at the Buried Man. The performer would have smuggled in food, oxygen would be fed through a tube, and whenever there was a lull in paying customers, the performer would be given water through a straw. Let's not take too much time to consider other biological needs. Through his often impoverished experiences as a sideshow act, Browning saw society from an alternate perspective. He brought that perspective with him when MGM executive Irvin Tholberg allowed him to choose his next project in 1925. Browning chose the Todd Robbins novel The Unholy Three. The novel was considered unfilmable and macabre. The focus on the story is on midget sideshow performer Tweedledee. Their words, not mine. That being said, the book sympathized with its little person hero. Tweedledee is embittered at the ridicule he experiences as a sideshow performer. He turns to crime by enlisting a dim-witted strongman and a cross-dressing man with a split personality. Tholberg saw the potential for macabre thrills in reteaming Browning and actor Lon Chaney, who'd already worked together on two projects, including the crime drama The Wicked Darling. Though there was one problem to be solved first. Chaney was known for masterful makeup performances, but they had no way to easily make him play the diminutive Tweedledee. The filmmakers thus swapped lead characters to somebody Chaney could play. They rewrote the insane crossdresser into a devious, entirely sane ventriloquist named Echo. Lon Chaney could finally lead the cast. Victor McLaughlin played the strongman Hercules, and Harry Earls was given the now less important part of Tweedledee. The story was hardly politically correct then or now, yet it is a fun crime film with a particularly macabre tone. It's only included in the horror genre because of Cheney, Browning, and, oh yeah, a giant murderous ape. Trust me, I'll be covering killer apes very soon, as they were a staple of early horror cinema. The Unholy Three was a smash hit, making six times its budget. Even the critics loved it. MGM quickly capitalized on the pairing of Browning and Cheney, and they made seven more films together, the most famous of which is one you can't see. London After Midnight is one of the most sought-after lost films. Cheney portrays a vampire who intrudes on a murder investigation in an old dark house. Of course, it is revealed that Cheney's vampire is not in fact a vampire, but rather a police inspector playing dress-up in order to discover the culprit. What makes the film interesting in context of freaks is exactly this carnival-like ruse. The concept of performance art is a key plot point, and the film was said to actually feature Lon Chaney's legendary makeup box as a prop. The idea of putting on a show was equally important plot elements in The Unknown and West of Zanzibar. In The Unknown, Lon Chaney plays a criminal hiding out by pretending to be an armless performer in a traveling circus. Macabre mayhem ensues. In West of Zanzibar, Browning revisits a favorite theme, where a long-lost father has a dark influence on his daughter's life. All in all, typical Browning material. Browning entered the sound era with a couple of shaky crime dramas, including this film, The Thirteenth Chair. The film is primarily notable for its use of Bela Lugosi, who despite playing a detective, acts like, well, a vampire. He told Madame Lagrange the name. You agreed to all this. Why didn't you speak the name? This was, according to biographers Skull and Savada, done on purpose by Browning as a way to test Bela Lugosi for the bigger production of Dracula. With Dracula's massive box office success in 1931, Irvin Tholberg lured Todd Browning back to MGM, where he'd made most of his films with Lon Chaney. Tholberg was Browning's champion. 
and Browning had had a miserable experience over at Universal. He was happy to rejoin his former home. Thalberg asked Browning what he wanted to do next. Browning answered, Freaks. The plot came from a short story by Todd Robbins of Unholy Three fame, and it was right up Browning's alley. The short story, called Spurs, concerned a normal-sized circus performer who marries a rich little person for his money, but the little man exacts his vengeance by forcing her to carry him horseback style across Europe. Hence the title, Spurs. Giddy up indeed. For the film Freaks, Browning wanted a more direct form of vengeance. The story concerns a troop of sideshow freaks celebrating the upcoming marriage between little person Hans, played by Unholy Three veteran Harry Earls, and normal circus performer Cleopatra, played by Olga Baklanova. However, the marriage is a sham, with Cleopatra conspiring with strongman lover Hercules to poison Hans and claim his fortune as inheritance. At the marriage ceremony, the ruse is up when a drunken Cleopatra is revolted by the freaks. Browning takes the idea of performance, this time the inclusive Gooba Gaba One of Us chant, and has it interrupted by a disrespectful normal person, which then cuts deeper with brutal mockery. The freaks take revenge on Cleopatra and Hercules. In one of the most effective climaxes in early horror cinema, Cleopatra and Hercules are pursued, and they're made into freaks themselves, with Cleopatra carved into a duck lady. and with Hercules being castrated. He later shows up in the story as a castrato singer. While the nightmarish climax is a marvelous sequence, I think perhaps the heartbreaking wedding feast is the film's true highlight. It cleverly places the audiences on the side of the freaks, removing all doubt about who to root for. At least, that was the intent of the filmmakers. In the 1930s, the culture wasn't quite ready to accept these outsiders as heroes. This was, apparently, an era where a physical deformity was enough to label somebody a bad guy. Behind the scenes at MGM, a producer lobbied the studio heads to eject the deformed actors from the commissary, as apparently eating in their presence was revolting. A new, temporary commissary was erected for the cast of Browning's film. At test screenings, Freaks was deemed disgusting and exploitative and in bad taste. After a brief, unsuccessful theatrical release, MGM recut the film, chopping half an hour off the 90-minute negative. Among the footage removed was Hercules singing castrato soprano, and most of Cleopatra as a surgically altered duck lady. The studio shot a new, happyish ending, and tried releasing it again. It didn't help, as the film was inherently a dark fable where the freaks were the heroes, and the normal Cleopatra and Hercules were the villains. The film simply proved too much for 1930s tastes. The original 90-minute version hasn't been seen since 1932, and it is likely gone forever. Shortly after its release, MGM dumped the film, selling the distribution rights for the next 25 years to Dwayne Esper. Esper had made a career as a traveling film carny, showing audiences nudist material and exploitation footage. He is perhaps best known for distributing Reefer Madness, which has a hilariously hyperbolic view of the effects of marijuana. It is ironic, I think, that the film Freaks ended up as a traveling sideshow act, rejected by its studio home. It was a fate shared by so many of the Freaks themselves, finding themselves outside of society, looking in. Then, the world changed. The 1960s happened. Hippies, drugs, counterculture, political turmoil, revolution, rock and roll, the death of the Hays Code, and so many other things conspired to change everything. And freaks emerged from the chaos and became a counterculture film. The world was, after 30 odd years, finally willing to see things a little differently. The forgotten Todd Browning suddenly re-emerged as an important filmmaker. He had, after Freaks, found himself nearly unemployable. Three years after the film's release, he managed to convince MGM, who still had his contract, to let him remake London After Midnight. 
He combined the plot of that film with the visual imagery of his greatest commercial hit, Dracula, and made Mark of the Vampire in 1935. The film wasn't very good, despite strong visuals, but it did eke out a small profit. Browning followed that up in 1936 with The Devil Doll, which revisited his typical estranged father plot. Again, the film eked out a small profit. When Irving Tholberg died in 1936, Browning lost his last supporter at the studio. He only made one more film, Miracles for Sale. When Browning passed away in 1962, Freaks was re-evaluated. Browning was viewed as an auteur by Carrière de Cinema, and soon his surviving films became available in revival houses. Generally, people tended to like his films, but they more than liked Freaks. They loved it. What struck modern audiences about Freaks was its immense humanity. Despite awkward pacing and many narrative dead spots in the first half, the film had a soul and a unique identity. Horror films often focus on outsiders, the misunderstood monsters, the mistreated and neglected. And few films do this as well, as deeply and as compassionately as Freaks. Though, according to David J. Skull and Elias Savada, the view of Freaks as a humanist film only came about in the 1960s, and that such a view may not have been intended by Browning back in the day. In their biography, they paint a meticulous picture of a complicated, difficult, abusive, drunken, and often egotistical director. And while this perspective is admirably blunt, I'm not sure I entirely support their conclusion. I think the humanism is very much present and intentional in Freaks. Yes, Skull and Savada's argument is complex and compelling. They support their views with several pages of recent argument. But I do believe that humanism can be found even among the most brutal people, especially in outsiders like Todd Browning, who was, by all accounts, a broken man long before his career floundered. Perhaps he couldn't sympathize with normal people, and that's why so many considered him a sadist, but he sure put his heart and soul into sympathizing with other broken people. He seemed to understand them. In Freaks, it is so very obvious. But let's just say that the film was exploitative when originally made, and that its humanism is something that later horror audiences have attributed to the film. Well, that doesn't make the film any less humane. Audiences adopt art, seeing aspects of a work the author or creator may have been unaware of or never even intended. With regards to Freaks, I think that makes us, the horror audience, a better, more recent, more intelligent audience than we were in generations past. Because we're more inclusive, more willing to accept the outsiders, and we're willing to view ourselves as one of them. My name is Wolfcraft. This is History of Horror. If you liked the episode, I'd sure appreciate a like, share, and subscribe. Join me next time for episode 17, Robot Monsters. Also, if you want to check out some of my other works, I'm an author. My science fiction novel, God of Desolation, is currently available on Amazon. And my mystery novel, Richly Drawn, will soon be available at inkshares.com. Thanks a plenty. <laughs>